invite you to join me in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34. And I will give you a moment to turn there. It's been a little while since we've been in the book of Ezekiel. I, as a church, whether it be on Sunday morning or in a Bible study. But uh, several years ago, we went through a Bible study about the end times. And uh, a few years ago, we went through a brief uh, study of what is to come for the church. We looked briefly at the book of Ezekiel, and uh, it's uh, a unique and powerful book. Every time I go into it, I think, oh, I want to study this book more. I want to preach from this book someday. So uh, I'm going to start today in chapter 34. Eventually, I would like to do several messages out of this book. It's a remarkable book full of profound truths that will just smack you upside the head and say, wow, God is awesome. And chapter 34 is one of these passages, one of these chapters. Here we see God revealing himself in a very powerful and unique way, in a way that is fitting for us to examine and study here at this time of Christmas, in this Christmas season. I'll be reading verses 11 through 31 and speaking briefly on several of these verses for us this morning as we look at the promised shepherd. Ezekiel 34, verse 11. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the country. And I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring this back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Verse 17, As for you, my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will judge between one sheep and another, and between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? Must you also trample the rest of your pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the rest with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trampled and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you shove with flank and shoulder, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away. I will save my flock, and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 25. I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of wild beasts so that they may live in the desert and sleep in the forests in safety. I will bless them in the places surrounded by hills. I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. The trees of the field will yield their fruits ground will yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. They will know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of those who enslave them. They will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety, and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land, or bear the scorn of the nations. 
Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord, sovereign Lord. You, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are people, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. Powerful passage, amen? I hope you recognized a few of the allusions that are in there that the gospel writers and apostles brought out. We're going to look at those in just a few moments. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to go through this verse by verse. We would be here all afternoon. But just briefly, to get us to understand what the situation is in which Ezekiel, Ezekiel is talking about here, why he's talking. He was a priest in Jerusalem, Ezekiel was. And at the time when the Babylonians first came and began besieging and began to conquer the land of Judah and destroy the city of Jerusalem, they did so three different times. And the first time, Ezekiel and other royal family, other priest members, were taken back to the land of Babylon. Daniel, Shadrach, uh, I don't remember their Hebrew names, but Daniel and friends and Ezekiel went as part of this first deportation, this first part of this exile. There, in exile, God began speaking through Ezekiel to the exiles. This book was written to those in exile in Babylon. And there's a lot of different reasons for that, but one of them is to help them understand why they're there and the hope that they can still have, even in their judgment. Ezekiel 34 is specifically about God talking about the wicked shepherds, the wicked rulers in all aspects of their society, whether it be kings, priests, governors, uh, and all the royalty and all of the authorities in between, in every area of their society, they were all wicked, corrupt people. And so God says something needs to be done about this. And he brought the judgment and he brings a promise of deliverance. Verses 1 through 10 are a severe indictment. It's the charges against these wicked people in the land of Judah. Verses 11 through 31, which we're going to look at here this morning, are all about how God is going to intervene and provide true, a true and righteous shepherd. This is what I want us to see in this season of Christmas, in this passage, there are elements of Christmas, elements of the cross here. There is an element of truth here for us, because the whole Bible, including the Old Testament, is for New Testament believers. The, Old, the New Testament is built off of the Old. So we're going to look briefly at a few of these things this morning, what they mean for us as Christians, New Testament believers. Real quickly, this passage, if you think about and you read and study Psalm 23, or John chapter 10, verses 1 through 42, these are, they share of many similarities, and there's a lot of comparisons that you can bring. In fact, um, John, I think, was part bringing some of this truth into that chapter uh, when he was writing that passage. And Jesus, when he was speaking about himself being the good shepherd, was reflecting upon this passage. So for us this morning, the promised shepherd. God has provided the great shepherd, Jesus, who leads us to peace and blessing. These first few verses here, 11 through 16, God declares that he will shepherd his people. I'm not going to read through all these verses again, but verse 15 is critical. Here he says, I myself will tend. Look, as you read through these verses 11 through 31, just count how many times the word I shows up, or I myself, or myself. God declares over and over and over and over again that he is going to step into human history and intervene for his people once again. And that is a great message of hope for a people in great darkness and despair. I myself will search. I will rescue. I will bring, I will tend, I will search, I will bind, I will heal. We have here in these verses God declaring that he is going to personally get involved. Tell me what other religion has a God that personally gets involved in the lives of his people for their benefit as well as for his glory. It doesn't happen. Only the God of Israel, only the God of the Bible, 
only Christ gets involved in the lives of his people for their benefit and for his glory. This is nothing new in the Old Testament, of course, seeing God as a shepherd. In Genesis 49, 24, Jacob is giving a blessing to his sons. And he, instead of just Joseph, he gives a blessing to Joseph's sons as well. And he says in that that God is one who shepherds his people. The mighty one of Jacob, he is the shepherd, the rock of Israel, he says. And again, we see here that God says he will rescue, he will bring, he will tend, he will search. That's what a shepherd does. They guide their sheep wherever the shepherd thinks is the best place for them to go. And they do it with just their voice. We've heard many stories about shepherds over the years from many pastors talking about the great shepherd, the good shepherd, about how many shepherds will gather at like a watering hole and their flocks will be mixed. And the shepherd will raise his voice and call his sheep, usually with a song, and start walking away and his sheep will follow him. Well, one day a visitor to this watering hole uh, said, let me try. So he put on, he started walking away and started singing his song, and none of the sheep followed him. But as soon as their shepherd stepped out and began singing and calling them, his sheep followed. And all of the shepherds took their sheep, and not one was missing. God is that kind of a shepherd for his people, whether they be the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, or the descendants of Abraham by faith, which is us in Christ. He searches. This prophecy that Ezekiel is giving here has dual meanings. It was given to the people of Judah at that time who were suffering and struggling with the deportation, the exile, the loss of their temple, the loss of their king. But it's also for us. For them, the prophecy was fulfilled when Israel returned to the land to a degree. They came back, and they did prosper, but they were never quite fulfilling what God had promised for them that would happen. That's yet to come, even today. While Israel is being regathered to its land as an ethnic nation, once again, it's not fully yet what God has said it will be, and that is yet to come as we've studied some future eschatology history that's to come, and the church as well, the millennial reign of Christ will finally fully bring all of the promises of Israel into light. And we will get to be a part of that as well as being a part of the church. The other prophets and other gospel writers draw from this for the life and ministry of Jesus, Israel's Messiah. You can read about it in Luke and in Isaiah and in Micah. The book of Micah and how God says that he will shepherd his people. His coming one, his servant, will be a shepherd who will look after his sheep. These promises are fulfilled spiritually for us who are in Christ as the book of Hebrews goes way above and beyond to share with us. But there is a time to come when some of these promises will be given in a very physical and tangible way. God will bless his people. And this will happen only because God will provide one true shepherd. Verses 17 through 24. And this one true shepherd will involve judgment will involve a special servant. In verse 23, we have a direct reference to Jesus as the one shepherd. The promise to Ezekiel and to Judah is that God will provide a shepherd who will be like David. David was a shepherd. Remember when he came to be called as king? You know, Samuel came and showed up at Jesse's house and he said, I want to see your sons. One of them is going to be the future king. And all but little David, who's out with the sheep, were called and they were all rejected. They had to wait for David to come in from the fields. And even after he was anointed king, he went back out into the fields. God called a little boy who was a shepherd to shepherd his people. And the idea of who the Messiah, the coming Messiah, would be. It's a reminder of the time of King David, when Israel was beginning to be at its greatest moment, at least up to that time. Through Solomon, they lived at their greatest height. God's promise that one of David's sons would sit on his throne forever. Verse 23 reminds us of this. It is through this one shepherd that would come through the line of David that God would personally get involved in a very special way in the lives of his people. Verses 17 through 21 hopefully bring to mind what Jesus taught about in Matthew 25. 
But this shepherd is going to also be a judge. There's times when maybe the sheep are wrestling with each other too much, and they're beating each other too much, and so the shepherd's got to get involved and separate some of the sheep so that they don't you know, hurt each other. Jesus is going to come and bring judgment. At the end of what we know of as the tribulation, there will be the sheep and goats judgment. Sheep on one side, goats on the other. The sheep get to go into eternal bliss and the goats to eternal judgment. Here in Ezekiel, God is saying that the corrupt shepherds and those who followed them will be judged for their sin. The corrupt shepherds, what they would do, especially during times of national tragedy is that they would gather up all of the resources, they would hoard everything for themselves, and in the process, not just leaving nothing for the little people, but they would destroy anything that the little people had. And that's what it's talking about here when it says muddying the waters and trampling the pasture lands. God's shepherds, the influencers, the shakers, the movers, and the Israel's Jewish society forgot about the little people by just protecting themselves because they had the means to do so. We've seen this even in our own nation, have we not? Even today. Our leaders benefit from laws that they make or from tragic situations that afflict our nation. We see people, everyday people, going and just taking everything they can off the shelves, just in case. You know, not, not just you know, building up for a couple of weeks or maybe a month, but like, I want all of the toilet paper on the, in the store for myself. This is what happens when people turn away from God and do not trust God to provide for their needs. And so God is going to judge. He judged those shepherds in that day, and he will judge those people who are against his people in the future. So to bring a message of hope for a people in exile, God tells them that justice is coming. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I've got to be honest with you, though, and share also that in verses 23 and 24, there is a little bit of debate about who this character is. Is it David himself? Is it Jesus the Messiah that's being referred to? I think it's both. Why can't it be both? The language doesn't say that it has to be one or the other. It can be both. There are other chapters in Ezekiel 37 that talk about David as reigning during the millennial reign of Christ, but reigning not as the king of kings, but as an under king, as a prince, while well, Jesus, his son, the Messiah, reigns as king. Both are referred to as God's servant. God is giving this prophecy, this promise to his people at a bleak time when hope was small. As we learned in Sunday school this morning, we celebrate Christmas. Unusually, I don't know if God did it. It must have been God because it just seems so fitting, but during one of the darkest times of the year, physically speaking. I mean, just think about it. The 21st, 22nd, somewhere around there is the shortest daylight time of the year. The winter months are the bleakest, the most depressing. But yet that's when we have one of our greatest celebrations. We have another great celebration after in the spring, talking about new life, new life in Christ. Did Ezekiel know when he was talking about especially everything pertaining to the coming Messiah, I doubt it. It's possible. Often the prophets did not know everything that they were sharing. But in being inspired by the Spirit, Jesus, and of course being the Son of God, but also the apostles, as they're looking back, they're drawing out truths in which God placed these nuggets of truth and promise and hope for his people. So that we would trust in the one shepherd. Jeremiah 30, verse 9 says, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. When Jeremiah wrote those words, David had been dead for centuries. And all of a sudden, David's going to be raised up to rule again. God is going to fulfill his promise to David. He himself will sit on a throne, and his greatest son, Jesus, will sit on the throne. We also know from John 10 that Jesus is this great shepherd, this good shepherd who unites not only the Jewish flock, but also the Gentile flock into one flock, which will inhabit the earth, the money of Christ, and enter into eternity. Jesus teaches about this often when he teaches about the great feast that is to come, when the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints will gather together in the marriage supper of the Lamb. God has provided and is saving 
through his shepherd, Jesus. But he's also going to bring peace through his shepherd. We see this in verse 25, specifically, and then through the rest of these verses, the blessings of that peace. What does that peace look like? He says, I will make a covenant of peace, in verse 25. A new covenant, which has been promised already through the prophet Jeremiah, who was prophesying and writing just before the Babylonians come. And then just about a couple years after Jeremiah is done with his main prophecy, Ezekiel is taken away and given these, given these other promises, referring back to the promises and prophecies of Jeremiah. A new covenant would come. And he's telling about the blessing of that new covenant for ethnic Israel, the people of Israel, Judah, at that time, and for us in a spiritual way, and in a way we'll experience in the millennial reign of Christ. God's new covenant first told in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and also in Ezekiel 36 and 37. In fact, if you read from Ezekiel 34 through the end of the chapter, what we get is a progression of God's redemptive plan, bringing Israel back to the land, making them one nation, and then bringing them to a nation of faith, bringing the temple back in in a future time, bringing the Messiah in to rule and reign, eventually leading to eternity with Christ and with God forever. This new covenant is the covenant that we celebrated just a few moments ago. Cut by Jesus' own blood. Because that's how covenants were paid. You paid in blood. Showing that if I do not uphold my end of this bargain, of this contract, of this deal, then you can take my life. And who better to seal such a wonderful covenant than God in the flesh? I always keep my promises. I can never die again, the book of Romans tells us, because I've already died for sin, for the sin of the world, and I have no sin to die for my own. I cannot die again. I live eternally, bringing this covenant as an eternal covenant for God's people, people of faith. There's going to be many physical applications to this peace, this covenant of peace. The land of Israel will prosper once again. The land will be a place of safety, from nature and from mankind that has yet to happen for the people of Israel. It's never happened, but it will someday soon when Christ reigns from the throne in Jerusalem on the Holy Hill. The most important aspect, though, of all of these verses is that these truths and applications are true for us in Christ. It's also part of what Jesus was teaching when he taught about himself as the good shepherd. When he talked about the shepherd looking for the lost sheep, that is God. That is Jesus. He came down to look amongst sheep for his lost sheep, those who would accept his invitation by faith, trusting in him, that he would lay his life down for them, that they would be forgiven and have eternal life. Christmas is not just a time of celebrating the birth of God's Son, who is our Savior. It's also a time of celebrating the truth that God is a promise-keeping, promise-fulfilling God, and that there is more to come it is not over. We have much hope for what has yet to come. Christ will come for his church. The promises that have yet to be fulfilled for Israel, we will see those happen or hear about them happen in some way, shape, or form. I'm not exactly sure how all of that is going to entirely work out detail by detail. But we know for sure that God will bring it about because he's already brought about so many promises in the past. And we get to experience the peace with God that we have in Christ. Peace with one another. And eventually peace throughout the world as the king reigns on high. So for us this morning, two really important things. Do you recognize and see how involved God is and wants to be in your life? We often take it for granted. We often don't think about it. We were talking about this this morning in Sunday school. Every moment of our day, of our life, is an opportunity to see, God, how are you active? How are you present here? Whether it's a little thing like the car won't start or the computer's giving you fits or the kids are driving you nuts, whatever it is, it's an opportunity for God to show himself faithful and true, to tend to you, to tend to me, to bless us, to lead us, to guide us, to protect us as we trust in him. So we learn to trust the shepherd moment by moment, day by day, that he alone is the one who gives eternal life. That he alone is where we find peace. That we can seek him and his promises, be reminded of them, be secured by them, by his word. We 
we can allow the shepherd Jesus to serve us. And we have a hard time with that. We have a hard time allowing people to serve us. But there's a reason that there is still a community of faith. There's a reason that there are new under-shepherds, as the Apostle Peter writes about in the book of Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 5. There are under-shepherds, pastors, that are given to help shepherd local communities of faithful believers. Pray for your pastor and other pastors that you know. Pray that we would be shepherds like Christ is a shepherd, that we would tend to you as we need to. I've often said that I don't do enough as pastor, and many of you are like, Pastor, I can't believe you can say that. You do so much. But there's some tending that I can do and that I need to do. There's some things that I'm aware of where I fall short. I need to be more aware of how God is working in your life. Maybe even where you're falling short in your life so that I can tend to you in a more personal way, not just in a general broad way on Sunday mornings. Sometimes we don't want to call the pastor when there's a need or when we're in a situation or in a hospital or something like that. But one of the reasons why there's pastors, one of the reasons why there were priests was to be a physical representation that God is among you. And he is here to tend to you in your time of need. Even if you think you can handle it, reach out to your shepherd. Reach out to your shepherds and under shepherds as well. That we might tend to you and help you walk through those dark valleys, those dark moments, knowing that God is a faithful, promise keeping God who loves you, sent his son for you, and is with you always. In fact, he's not just among us, he is within us. Let us continue to live in that promise that Christ has come. He is our promise shepherd. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for these words. And while there's so much that we have just glossed over this morning, we thank you for these powerful truths and these reminders. Especially the reminder of the truth that you are present among us. You want to be with us. You want to restore Eden and the relationship that you had with humanity in the Garden of Eden before the fall. And you have done so, begun to do so through Christ, your true and promised shepherd. Through his death and resurrection, we can have peace with you. We can be forgiven of our guilt and shame, restored in Christ-like fashion to be like him. Help us to trust you in the daily moments, the moments that are frustrating, the moments in which we are scared, the moments in which we don't know how we're going to take another step or another breath. Help us to trust you, to trust one another, and to trust the shepherds that you bring into our lives to lead us and guide us into stronger faith. Help, Father, the pastors within this congregation, families and friends, myself, Help us to be the representation that we need to be of Christ and who he is. Proclaiming truth, being there in difficult and joyful moments, to be a reminder that you are real, that you keep your promises, and that we can trust in you. Strengthen your church, strengthen your flock, strengthen your shepherds, Father. We pray all over the world as churches gather to proclaim truth, as pastors lead their, their sheep, their flock, be bolder, braver, more knowledgeable, more loving, gracious disciples of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love for us and send in your promise, Shepherd. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we close this morning, let us turn once again to the favorite Christmas carol, Joy to the World, and sing the final verse. A verse that reminds us that the King is coming, and he will bring peace righteousness to the world. Let's stand together.
he is ruling on high, that we can trust in him and what he brings to pass in our daily lives. He's called us, commissioned us to go and share this truth that he has come. Let us commit ourselves once again to this grand mission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Father, we thank you for including us in this grand plan of redemption. And we have the opportunity to proclaim that the Shepherd has come, the Savior has come. Give us strength, give us courage and wisdom to go and to proclaim Christ as Savior, especially through this Christmas season. Pray that you would continue to bring us together to celebrate, to worship, and to learn and grow in his name.